<clears throat> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this digital event. My name is Simon Bustamante, and I'm the seminar coordinator and a member of the board of Svenska Sällskapet för Philosophisk Praxis, or in English, the Swedish Association for Philosophical Practice. We are a non-profit association promoting the uh, uh, practice of philosophical dialogue in Swedish society. Uh, we want to take philosophy out of a strict uh, academic setting and into everyday life. And one way uh, that we do this or try to do this is through book seminars uh, like this one. And uh, tonight's guest is Andy West, a British philosophy teacher who teaches philosophy in prisons. His debut book is called The Life Inside, a memoir of prison, family, and philosophy. So without much further ado, Andy West, uh, take it away. And welcome. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, thank you. It's such a, um, a great uh, pleasure to talk to philosophers who already have this preoccupation for philosophy that sort of fits with everyday life. Oh, hello. Can you see me? Yes, we can see you. My, my, uh, computer just took me off Zoom, I have no idea why. Um, yes, it's such a pleasure um, to, to, to be in a forum that feels so fitting for the material I'm going to talk about. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about freedom and the different ways in which people search for freedom and how uh, I've noticed all the sort of different profiles or personalities or strategies that people have for finding freedom uh, in relation to the prison system. And uh, they're kind of, there's a, the, the philosophy behind those ideas. Um, it's gonna involve looking at things like Stoicism, things like Camus, but then also some, some very, um, some ideas that are in the political conversation at the moment, such as reform and abolition and things like that. Um, let's go to this. Now I've just I've just moved some of the uh, material from the left side uh, from from away from the right corner of the screen so that it it's um you should be able to see it unobstructed so I hope that helps. Um, okay, so this is one of the prisons where I teach. Uh, it's called HMP Pentonville. It's about 178 years old. Uh, it's five floors tall. It's crumbling. They give it a lick of paint every um, few years uh, to sort of make it look pretty, but um, there's rats and there's cockroaches um, inside it. Um, uh, it's weirdly one of the prisons I most like teaching in because it's in King's Cross in the centre of London. And a lot of prisons are, you know, not in areas of prime real estate. They're very, very far from the city. Uh, they're often obscured, they're deliberately difficult to get to, they're remote, um, and getting there often takes trains and taxis and all sorts of um, convoluted uh, methods. Um, as I said earlier, um, there's so much you can talk about with freedom. You can talk about power, you can talk about time, you can talk about gallows humour um, and dark comedy, because that seems to be as as present in any prison I've been in as anything else. Um, but freedom is, a, is um, you know, the thing we think of most when we think of prisons in terms of confinement. Um, and it's the thing that maybe resonates the most for people. Um, I've met many people who've tried to be free in different ways. Um, one of them includes, uh, one of the stories that, that's important here for me to talk about, I suppose, is my own. Um, in that when I was a kid, uh, my dad and my brother and my uncle were all in prison. And so, uh, you know, I would go into prison and visit um, and then come out again and try and make sense of the world outside, now having glimpsed the edges of this much more kind of sinister and troubling world inside. This isn't a photo of me, I have to say. Um, it's a photo from a prison photographer, but I do love it as an image of freedom because he's quite clearly having his freedom constrained in this photo by, by sort of being security searched. But there's something about the arms stretched out and the look on the face, which 
there's maybe a defiant form of freedom in there nonetheless. Um, the five kind of profiles I want to talk about today are the stoic, the happy prisoner, the rebel, the reformist, and the radical. Uh, each of these will make more sense in turn. Let's get stuck in straight away with um, a kind of prisoner who I refer to as the stoic. Um, stoicism is, I think, quite attractive to prisoners in lots of ways. Uh, unsurprisingly, you know, when the stoics were writing, it was about how do you live under great turmoil? How, how do you survive and remain serene and even happy in times of tumult or violence or threat? And so it makes sense why someone living in that kind of extremists in prison would listen to the teachings of Epictetus or um, Seneca. Um, uh, here's a man who keeps his cell incredibly ordered. This is a very, very tidy prison cell, I can tell you. Um, and disciplined and I think lives by their will. You know, they don't have the freedom to, to go out wandering or they can't go out and party very easily, but they can live by their will. Um, there was a man who um, I was talking with Epictetus about, and I told this story about how Epictetus um, was a slave. And uh, one day his slave, his master, um, was in a bad mood and uh, became very violent and um, damaged, very severely damaged Epictetus's leg. And Epictetus, in a, in a moment of stoic retort, said, uh, you may fetter my leg, but you will not, but not even Zeus himself can uh, sort of take my will. Um, Wallace, the student I was talking to about this, heard this and told me all kinds of details about his day, like how um, at five o'clock every night, the guards come around and lock uh, everyone's cell for the evening. Um, and, you know, Wallace has no power to control that and when that happens and he doesn't have a set of keys it's still locked from the outside by the officer um, so what he would do is five minutes before the officers shut the cell doors he would shut his himself uh, likewise when he was on the phone downstairs in the landing um, the officers would call time that you know you have to hang up now um, and then they would have to say goodbye to the wives, girlfriends, mothers, fathers, whoever they were talking to, children, and hang up. Wallace said he always made sure that he hung up a minute before the officers said that he had to. Um, and I said, do you think that's, um, do you think that's freedom? Do you think that's the sort of freedom that you're looking for in that? And he said, well, it keeps things simple uh, because if I kept on talking and the officer put his finger on the receiver, uh, I know that would really upset me. And if I'm really upset, I'm going to do something I regret. So it's a kind of freedom. It's a kind of guardedness against himself and his own impulses, which perhaps is another, another stoic trait. Um, many people I notice live by this diet of intense will and exercise and focus and study in prison. Um, other people uh, I would call happy prisoners. Um, I've never worked with this woman again. This is a, a, an anonymous photo, but it's of a, a woman in prison in the UK. Uh, seems quite a nice sort of bed with those teddies and she doesn't look sort of miserable. Um, I remember speaking to a woman in prison once and she told me that being inside was um, me time time for herself and that she um you know inside she got to be free from abusive relationships and got to avoid the worst of where her drug addiction could take her and things like that and she was quite happy to be in prison and um you know would often sort of get herself arrested if she were released so that she could come back um in a men's prison i i um told the story of odysseus and the sirens I love this rendering of it by John Waterhouse. The sirens trying to attempt Odysseus's men to the rocks or at least to abandon ship and become dinner for them for the night. And um, there was a man I taught in a class.
at Balmain mm -hmm. Maximum Security Prison um, here in London, who said that it was these men who were the most free. These are the men who have wax in their ears that, and then their ears are bandaged. So they can't actually hear the sirens. There's no temptation there. They're quite oblivious really and ignorant of what's going on. They're just rowing the ship or if they work in the kitchen preparing food, they just go about their daily life, uh, just follow the regime of the ship. And he said, it's a bit like me in prison. I just follow the regime here and I'm free. And I said, well, what are you, in what way are you free? And he said, I'm free from choice, um, which is a, an interesting form of freedom, a very paradoxical form, perhaps. Um, but it does make sense. You know, you get fed at a certain hour. The food's always a certain portion size. Uh, you have a bed. You're told when you wake up. You're told when your lights go out. You're told when you shower. Um, there is a kind of freedom from choice there. And that's not an altogether... Um, pathetic freedom or a freedom that I think it's a freedom lots of us long for I don't know if you've ever found yourself looking for a film on Netflix at 9 30 at night and you'll still be there at 11 p.m still scrolling just paralyzed by the um the plentitude of choice that's available he reminded me of um another stoic uh Seneca who um spoke about <coughs> our lives um, as being rather like a chariot with a dog chained to the back. Um, the chariot is a sort of fate, I suppose, that the Stoics idea that the future is fated and that the universe has a divine code that's already been written. Um, and Seneca said that, you know, we can either run in the opposite direction to the chariot, in which case we'll be dragged by the neck through the dirt, or we can be the dog that runs with the chariot in that direction, um, in which case we'll be happier. Um, maybe the happy prisoner is just is just a you know, in Seneca's sort of spirit of amor fati, they're kind of loving their fate, they're they're embracing it. Um, there's another type of person I've met in prison and outside of prison. In fact, this is my uncle. Uh, my uncle Frank, uh, who I would describe as a rebel, and maybe gets his freedom from his rebellion. And he says that, um, he told me this story once. So to give you a bit of context about my uncle, he first went to prison when he was 14 for stealing a crate of Coke cans, Coca-Cola cans from a corner shop. Uh, he was thrown in prison on remand and you're only supposed to be on remand for a few weeks uh, but he was kept there for three months which is an awful long time for a 14 year old a big chunk of your life a big percentage of all your experience so far and when it got to court when he was to be sentenced the judge said why has this boy been on remand for three months and then he, he was allowed to go but sadly he would um, return within a few months to prison and would be in and out until he was almost 60. Um, he came from the East End of London, which um, you may know from stories or visits, has um, always been a very kind of crimogenic place. Um, relationships between the working class people here and um, the police are not friendly. I think, I think um, you could do anything on my grandmother's estate and still be accepted by your neighbours except talk to the police. Um, trust is very, very thin. Um, and my uncle became, I suppose, what you'd call a non-residential burglar. So he never burgled homes or houses, but he would um, burgle warehouses and things like that, getting things like 300 laptops or 200 skiing jackets or that kind of thing, um, 500 fishing rods at a time, and then selling them. Um, uh, a story from when he was 15, he was in, um, uh, a boar stall, which is an old fashioned children's prison. They've been closed now because there were just too many cases of um, uh, abuses of power. And um, this boar stall was based on a military regime. It was this idea that you could straighten out sort of deviant young people by exposing them to intense physical discipline. So he was supposed to stand to attention outside his cell door and then be called down. 
uh, for his food and he would be asked to march down military style. Uh, but he uh, put his hands in his pockets and dragged his feet kind of swaggering. Um, the officers would demand that he marched, he would swagger even more luxuriously. Um, they would punch him in the stomach, he still wouldn't do what they said. He would get to his plate of food and they would completely cover it in salt and he would have to scrape all the salt off before he could eat it. And he continued with this sort of power struggle where they would ask him to do something to comply and he would do the opposite. He would be the dog going in the other direction. Eventually, um, because this was such a public display of defiance, uh, they put him in the segregation unit in the basement. Uh, a segregation unit is a prison cell that just has a concrete slab for a bed and there's no books, there's no television, not that there would have been in those days anyway. Um, and uh, you really are kind of left alone with your own thoughts. In the morning, an officer came in and gave him a shovel and told him to come outside and he was to dig a, a hole eight feet deep in the ground and then fill it back in again at the end of the day. And then the next day he was to dig a hole eight feet deep and then fill it in and then the next day in. So, you know, very futile work, meaningless labor there to sort of break your spirit. And I said to him, how did you not uh, go crazy when that was happening? How did you not break down and cry or um, just swing a shovel at someone's head? That's what I would do. And he said, I just loved it. I just pretended I loved it. I was like, what do you mean? And he said, well, when the officer would come in in the morning, I would spring off the concrete ledge that I've been sleeping on and I'd say, are we digging holes today? I really hope so. I love the idea of digging holes. Please tell me we're digging holes. I love it. And he would use this kind of ironic passion to pretend that he loved uh, the thing that they most wanted him to hate. And I suppose as he was talking about that, I thought of um, Sisyphus, who has a similarly futile task of pushing a boulder up a hill. Uh, and it rolling down again and pushing it up and it rolling down again. And it's Albert Camus who says that we must imagine Sisyphus happy, that Sisyphus does this with a kind of joy in his heart and that that's what makes him heroic because even though the gods finally feel like they're crushing this rebellious spirit, remember Sisyphus is, the reason he's in Hades is for his rebellion against the gods. Even taking his punishment, he can do it with rebellion. So I think, I think these figures, you know, the stoic, the happy prisoner, the rebel, they're finding a kind of freedom despite everything. They're finding a, they're saying there's this part of me here that you can't touch. There's this, this part of me that the system can't have, you know, it's claiming my liberty, but not, not here somewhere. With all three of them, they're interested in freedom that they show us a way to protect freedom on an individual level, how individual souls might maintain some corner of freedom through stoicism, through amor fati, through rebellion. But the reformist is someone who pans out a bit and says, to be free, it's not just about individuals, it's about the system and the system needs to change. This is what Hegel says about stoicism, that stoicism is a kind of half freedom it allows you know, slaves all the freedom they can have as slaves, but they're still unfree in virtue of being slaves. So reformists come along and what they want is better conditions. So this is a Norwegian prison. I don't know how you guys in Sweden think about Norwegian prisons because um, by all accounts, you have quite a decent prison system, certainly much more decent than ours, much more effective than ours. Um, but it's often held up as exemplary here, as something we should be striving towards. Um, <clears throat> you guys will have your own reformists, maybe with similar stories. Um, some, some things that reformists have done here quite successfully is um, end what was called slopping out. So this until, you know, 30 years ago, or 35 years ago, uh, it was completely common that people wouldn't have toilets in their cells they would just um, piss and shit in a bucket. 
and uh, have to live with that for a day or two and then swap out uh, when they got unlocked. Uh, it's obviously a very undignified and unhygienic and smelly way to live. Um, now there are toilets in cells because of reformist pressures, although some people say, well, living in a six by eight room with a toilet, you know, two inches from your pillow is not that much fun. Um, so as reforms go, it's good, but it's, it's still quite unpleasant. Um, reformists come in all sorts of unlikely packages. So this is Albert Pierpoint, who you may or may not know, but he was an executioner in the UK. He was Britain's chief executioner. And he uh, was so famed for, for how efficient he was. He could, he, the, from the moment he greeted you in the, in the um, cell that you were in for your final moments as, as um, a guilty man, as the condemned, he could take you into the chamber, put a bag on your head and noose, pull the trap door and it would all be over in seven seconds because he took perfect weights, he measured the vertebra perfectly, he measured the rope perfectly, and he got a clean death almost every single time. He was flown to Nuremberg to, um, uh, he was part of the Nuremberg uh, trials as well to, uh, to uh, carry out executions of Nazi guards. Um, when he retired, <laughs> Albert Pierpoint uh, said, I don't think the death penalty works, it should be, we should get rid of it. So there's a man who uh, for, for decades is for the prison system, and then after a while is for reforming it. Um, now, the reformist, you know, believes there's a much better and more imaginative way to do things, but they may still be a retributionist. They may still have this impulse that we need punishment. We need punishment either to modify behavior or we need punishment just because, you know, some people deserve to be punished for some things they do. What the reformist says, though, is the system of punishment we have at the moment is not fair or proportionate. Um, and it needs to be much better um, and it needs to create more and more growth and things like that. The radical, who I think in today's world takes the form of the abolition, uh, the abolitionist, such as Angela Davis, um, is quite different to the reformist. And as we'll see, the big culture war here is not between the abolitionists and the sort of um, far right, lock them up and throw away the key, tougher sentences, blah, 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 kind of punitive mindset. But the culture war here is slightly between the abolitionist and the reformist, but I'll get onto that in a minute. Angela Davis, key abolitionist, uh, had a partner who spent time in prison, uh, was briefly incarcerated herself. Um, the abolitionist stance, the first thing to say about their argument, it's a very complex argument, but the first thing to say, or there's a lot of moving parts to the argument, shall I say, but the, the, the first thing to say is they believe that imprisonment is fundamentally immoral, that just putting someone in a cage in these feral dustbins that we put people in these days um, uh, cannot be morally justified, uh, certainly not by, um, if you talk about deterrence, our prisons are lousy deterrent. If you talk about rehabilitation, prisons lousy at rehabilitating people, at least in its current incarnation. Um, and that it's just a violation, not just of civic rights, but of human rights, uh, the abolitionist is going to say. So that's their first stance. Um, the second one is, is that prisons cannot be reformed. So here's HMP Pentonville. Um, it has a pride flag uh, flying from the top. Um, celebrating um, LBGT uh, rights, um, QI as well. Um, I can't think of a more forceful demonstration of patriarchal power than a um, His Majesty's prison service. Uh, so although we may try and put lipstick on the pig, uh, the, the abolitionist is going to say, um, it doesn't matter what you do to prisons, you can't reform them. And they go through history and they pick out particular cases where reforms have actually made 
the system worse. Um, and not only made the system worse, but given it more legitimacy. Um, I should just add a qualifier at this point. I'm, I'm sort of talking about abolition from a very Socratic kind of point of curiosity. I don't know where I stand on it. Growing up, you know, personally, I would see my brother, meet him at the prison gate after he'd been inside for three months. We'd walk into town, a couple of hours later, he'd get stopped and searched by the police. And, you know, on some occasions, he'd have to go back to prison for whatever reason, he'd carrying heroin or something like that. Um, and I think what that did to me personally was um, just kind of numb me to possibilities of social change. Um, you take on a kind of depressive resignation to just the fact that this world, these lives, this institution, it just is what it is. It should be more imaginative, but it's not, and it probably won't be, and nobody cares. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm very sort of, it is what it is when it comes to prison. It's only really in the last two, two and a half years, perhaps the murder of George Floyd in America catalyzed a big conversation around prison abolition. It was taken much more seriously than it has been in the mainstream. And that's when I've, you know, at book events and things, I'll, I'll be talking and people say, what do you think of abolition? Are you an abolitionist? And I'll say, well, I don't know. Um, you know, what are the hours? How, <laughs> how, how <laughs> will I still get weekends off? Um, uh, so I'm still trying to figure it out. And uh, that's part of this sort of process I'm sharing with you. So I'm, I'm trying to represent the abolitionist argument as positively as I can whilst also bringing up a few concerns, which I'll do in a minute. Um, prisons cannot be reformed. The carceral system cannot be reformed. So one thing we have in um, America and here, and I no doubt imagine it's happening in Sweden, is not incarceration, but e-carceration, this idea that you have a tag on your ankle, and instead of going to prison for six weeks, you'll be under house arrest for six weeks. You can't leave your house, you can't leave the boundaries of your house, particular times you're monitored. Um, reformists, um, abolitionists say, look, this kind of reform, it's often backed by someone like Serco or Capita or some big multinational company that wants our data and is probably has huge investments in the arms trade and things like that. These are sinister enterprises that really turn people's homes into surveillance spaces. You know, they know your exact movements throughout your house. Um, it's very peculiar when your home becomes that panopticon, the kind of the, the emotional freedom that you lose with that. Um, and actually this, this victory is not quite as, uh, as grand as we think it is. Um, another example is uh, drugs. So um, a lot of reformists say we need treatment programs rather than um, prison sentences for people with drug addictions. I can see how that makes good sense. People with drug addictions, if I think of my brother, he was you know, punishing himself so comprehensively uh, whilst on heroin that I don't think any judge or jury could come close to that kind of um, punishment uh, in terms of what they could give him. So prison really just didn't touch the sides. It, it really had no impact. It was never going to be a deterrent. Um, and, you know, rehab was the only thing that could um, could really have changed him, thankfully, and it did. Um, there's cases where judges in America have uh, some people, some people to re rehab or treatment programs instead of prison, but the only rehabs available are abstinence only ones. Now abstinence only rehab programs are, the evidence is mixed on whether they work for everybody. Some people need something else. Um, there's ideological reasons uh, from the Christian right as to why they're often preferred. Um, one of the risky things about an abstinence only program is if you uh, abstain from heroin for say three months on this program and then you relapse, uh, your tolerance has completely changed. And so if you relapse on, you know, even a quarter of the dose that you were taking before you were chronically addicted, when you were chronically addicted, 
uh, that sometimes results in death. Uh, so it's very high risk um, to issue people with that kind of treatment. I'm not saying it should never happen, but the abolitionist is saying uh, ref the reformists come with their own moral agenda here and it has serious impacts. Um, perhaps one of the most absurd um, reforms comes in the form of the death penalty. So um, in America now, there are more uh, botched executions, executions that go really wrong than there were when we used the guillotine. Uh, the guillotine, you know, a heavy, sharp blade, it falls, it cuts your head off in one go. Uh, I'm not saying there were never botched executions, but it was a very clean and swift way to die. Um, there's many cases of people who take four or five hours to die from lethal injection, who get swelling in the arms, a lot of intravenous drugs users um, are on death row, uh, they don't have clear veins, um, uh, drug compounds that don't quite work. So these kind of humane uh, adaptations can actually be much more um, bloody and awful and gruesome, uh, horrible absurdity. So the abolitionist says, look, reform just doesn't work. What you need to do is abolish. What that doesn't mean is let's close down all prisons now and let everyone out. Um, I think abolition is a, needs a name change. I think it should be called, they should lean more on their positive terminology like transformative justice because that allows people to picture something positive and actual. Abolition is just about the subtraction of something. And when you say abolitionism to people, they often see something like this, you know, looting, chaos, riots. Um, the abolitionist aim is to build a prison in which, build a world in which prisons are not necessary. So a world in which there is less income inequality, a world in which there is mental health provision, a world in which there is less social and racial justice, etc. cetera. Um, the abolitionist also um, talks about crime and punishment from a humane perspective. Uh, this is a young woman on YouTube whose video I found incredibly uh, um, affecting, I suppose. I still don't quite know what I make of it, but she was, um, she talks about being um, sexually abused uh, as a teenager um, by an older man and um, eventually, um, pressing charges, going to the police, pressing charges and going to court and actually he was convicted. Um, now I don't know what your conviction rates are like in Sweden, but um, in the UK, 3% of rape cases that are reported to the police end in conviction. 3% of rape cases that are reported to the police end in conviction. Um, so she is in an incredibly small minority. What she says here in this video is that the trial didn't help her. It was traumatizing for her, especially cross-examination. And she didn't really, apart from watching him go down, she didn't get anything that she might need as someone who's experienced that sort of trauma to grow, to make sense of it, to uh, rediscover her sexuality on her own terms to heal. Um, she she got a, you know she got she got justice, but she didn't really get any of the healing that she needed. And she said, you know, also what she wanted for her perpetrator was for him to take responsibility uh, and for him to be given an opportunity for moral growth and change, so that he wouldn't do it again rather than just throw him into uh, this sort of underworld where he would have to survive and become more and more brutal to survive and then emerge 20 years later, probably to reoffend. So there are cases of people who've, you know, faced the very worst crimes who are abolitionists and say, you know, this is why, this is why I'm an abolitionist, because it doesn't, it, it doesn't, um, the current system is too dehumanizing for everybody. Um, we've touched on this earlier, so I won't go over it too much again, but crime, it's not about malevolent individuals, it's not about serial killers in their mother's basement plotting to um, do evil, it's about poverty, it's about incompetence, it's about food and shelter, it's about pride and dignity, um, it's um, 
societies failing rather than individuals and therefore if we correct society we may not need prisons anymore we may have less crime and the crime we do have we can deal with by building communities of accountability so there would still be on a local horizontal level in the abolitionist world um, ways of taking responsibility and some kind of justice crucially this, these are communities which you know i see them around london people trying to start them <coughs> um, sort of activist communities people looking for alternative ways to do things communities that are not touched by corporate interests or state interests it's not the kind of top-down accountability that's dished out by uh, judges and the state and the um, law courts but an accountability that comes from uh, the bottom up. Um, something that people sometimes say about abolitionists is, yeah, but what about like really, really, really dangerous people? What about people who are like persistent reoffenders? Um, what do you do with them? Uh, here's um, Jack Henry Abbott, who uh, was in prison for murdering someone uh, uh, when he was quite young and spent a long time in prison, including in solitary confinement. He formed a, um, a pen pal relationship with the American writer Norman Mailer, which Mailer ended up sort of helping Abbott get out early and even got him a book deal and was taking him to parties in New York and things like that with Harper Lee and famous writers. And then very shortly after being released, Abbott killed somebody. And Mailer put his head in his hands and he said, why did you do that, Jack? And he said, well, I just wanted to know what it was like to kill someone. And Mailer said, but you've already done that. And Jack said, but that was ages ago. Um, so they're very clearly, you know, even if you control for social injustice, class inequality, racism, all of the things in our society that perhaps create crime, there may still be cases of people who um, do very bad things. And the dangerous few, as the abolitionists call them, would still need to be quarantined from the rest of us, would still need to be kept separate for our own safety, but they would not be kept in these you know, feral dustbins uh, that are our modern prisons, they would they would have they would be in dignified spaces this sometimes leads people to say well the abolitionist isn't really an abolitionist they're a, a carceral minimalist they do believe in incarceration but just minimally prison ending prison isn't just something that's good for prisoners uh says angela davis and the abolitionist it's good for all of us uh davis says that uh, one of the functions of prison is that it allows ordinary people on the outside to walk past and go, oh, the people in there are not free, but I am in virtue of not being in there. So it allows us to feel like we're free, even though maybe the government are making all sorts of changes to legislation about whether we can protest or not, about um, our taxes, about our rights and our right to privacy, for example. Um, even though our freedoms are being attacked all the time, given that we're not in freedom, it allows ordinary people to kind of cheerfully think that they are free. And that's the reason why abolition should matter to everybody. Um, freedom for the Stoic is there in their will. Freedom for the rebel is there in their defiance. Freedom for the abolitionist is in struggle. It's not um, a blissful end state. It's much more about the process. I want to just make a few, a tiny quick comment, because we want to go to questions in less than four minutes, um, about the abolitionists' uh, use of communities. Um, this is uh, a drawing of what's called rough music. Uh, so this is from an old Cornish village in, in England. Uh, um, would have happened about 300 years ago before we had a modern prison system. If someone had done something wrong in the village, like they hadn't paid a debt or they'd hit their wife or they'd stolen someone's pig, the community would come around at two in the morning and bang pots and pans until that person uh, had repented and apologized and made amends. 
If they still didn't do that, they would do it the next night. And if they still didn't do that, they would do it the next night and drag them out of bed and um, exile them, throw them out of the gates of the village, the boundary, the borders of the village. Um, so there is a kind of horizontal community uh, that we can look at through history. It's not always wise or kind, um, and it's not always humane. Um, I guess the abolitionist has a more idealistic vision for what human communities could be. My concern is that human communities, human groups tend to be quite frightening. Um, when I was a kid, there were several tabloids here who posted the names and addresses of paedophiles um, in the UK. And what it meant is there were um, several nights where um, vigilantes were just throwing bricks through windows, torching cars, you know, turning over vehicles in the street. Um, there was a paediatrician, okay, not a paedophile, a paediatrician, a doctor of children who had her house burnt down by some vigilantes. Very, very troubling, very distressing what happens when uh, communities deal with justice. Now, the abolitionists might say, look, this, these newspapers are owned by Rupert Murdoch. Um, this is a top-down form of manipulation. This is not mutual aid within communities. This is not horizontal in the same way. Twitter, again, the group think, the pylons, the online shaming that we see today, um, you know, public condemnation sometimes brings out the worst in people. Our communities really are, are the way forward. Again, the abolitionists would say, well, but this is, you know, this is um, Mark Zuckerberg and, and this is um, the algorithm and this is not what humans are at their best. But the fact is, we do live in a world with that. I, I don't know how we sort of, um, you know, how we vanish that side from our experience. So here we have uh, five forms of uh, freedom, the stoic, the happy prisoner, the rebel, the reformist or the radical. <clears throat> Radicals tend to think reformists are just slowing them down and just legitimizing the prison system. They're not hard enough, they're not pushing enough. Reformists tend to think that abolitionists and radicals are asking too much, they're too idealistic, they're self-indulgent, and they're not gonna actually create any real change. Maybe we should just be happy prisoners instead. Um, I just came home on the tube. I saw many happy prisoners on their phone, uh, just happy to scroll and click and get the dopamine hits. Um, it's not so bad, is it, being a happy prisoner? Um, there's more I could say about all of this, but I, I'm also sure that I'm in a room full of wonderful people who have great questions. And so I want to, uh, I really want to hear what you guys have to say. So I'm going to come out of that. And um, I've stopped sharing my screen now. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so I'd love to take um, questions. Um, are you happy to... Um, pick Simon people to talk and... yeah of course um thank you Andy uh, so let's open up for questions or comments you can either raise your hand or just talk into the mic hello Andy uh Christopher here uh thank you for the talk that was really interesting um what are what what do you think the prisons of the future will look like um do you see a positive path for prisons moving forward and becoming better, or do you see it maybe getting worse? Well, here we're building more prison spaces. We're building 10,000 more prison spaces, and our prison population has doubled in the last 30 years. So I certainly see it getting bigger. Both our Tory party and the Labour party here, um, they campaign on being tougher on crime. I think, um, I think it's an attempt to win the working class vote. I think it's a slightly unimaginative attempt. I think with private prisons as well, you've got people with more and more economic incentive to expand the prison system. At the same time, there is this conversation about abolitionism. There are a ton of documentaries on Netflix now, 13th and people like Ava DuVernier really bringing attention to just how overused prison is. Um, 
a, a friend of mine is actually um, an architect who's asked to consult on uh, new prisons being built. And, you know, uh, trauma is such a, a big word now and it's used everywhere from publishing to schools to business places and things like that. And she's been asked to advise on a trauma informed prison. And this can be things like if you've got a woman's prison and you know a lot of women in prison have a history of experiencing sexual violence don't have four male staff restraining a female prisoner that's the trauma-informed response um, other things seem to include having a curved wall rather than a square one rather than an angled one that the curved wall is you know just slightly nicer on the senses and therefore trauma-informed I think it's at that point maybe I start to recognise the abolitionists' argument that maybe prisons can't be reformed. That actually, actually, just being in prison is probably quite traumatic. You know, being away from your family and friends, being losing all your autonomy in that way, and that, that maybe a trauma-informed prison would be sort of no prison at all. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Tom? Hello. Uh, I wonder, uh, I didn't hear in the beginning if you were a teacher at uh, prisons. Did you teach uh, prisoner in, in uh, philosophy? Or? Yeah, so I teach at about, um, across the year I teach at about uh, nine different prisons mm -hmm. from high security, low security, men's, women's, children's prisons. I teach at a prison um, for sex offenders. Um, yeah, I was in HMP Brixton today, which is our oldest prison in London. It's 200 years old. Hmm. Um, so and did you did you have any, uh, is it uh, these uh, five types of prisons? Uh, is it your observation? And did you discuss these types? Uh, are you discussing these types of prisoners with your uh, pupils? Yeah, I mean, um, it's something I've I've come up with, I think, as a way of a sort of taxonomy of freedom. Um, and I, th I think the first, well, I think they're all modelled on people I know or types of people I know. Um, it's certainly not, um, you know, it's illustrative as a taxonomy rather than scientific. Um, but it, but I would very happily um, talk about it with um, some of my prisoners. Yeah, um, they're, they're, they're always kind of curious to, to know what I'm thinking and know what my opinion about stuff is. So I, I very happily. And uh, what was their comments? Oh, you? Um, so I haven't done it yet. This, this um, material is quite new. I only, um, I only wrote this last week. So, um, but, I, but I would certainly be happy to go into prison with it. Um, Andy, how common is it to have philosophy teachers in prisons in the UK, and uh, how big part it, it, it is it of the like the reform work of prisoners? To oh, philosophy? Um, it, uh, probably happens um, zero point zero one percent of the time. <laughs> um, I know a couple of people who've done it here and there. Um, the reasons are twofold. One is why on earth would you want to go and teach philosophy in prison? Um, in my case, you know, it's because I've got this family background, which mean I've always known about prisons from a young age. And I think that's always come, come with a sense of responsibility to remember that world and to pay recognition to it really. And, and also the knowledge that that world prison is philosophically very fertile. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very, pertinent place to discuss freedom, time, power, hope, shame, forgiveness, um, all these things. Secondly, um, it's just so hard to do anything in prison here. It's just so hard. I got given a bunch of money from the Royal Institute of Philosophy. I went to one prison, they just couldn't get back to me. They were like, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll do a philosophy course. They just couldn't get back to me. They just couldn't organize themselves. I went to another, they let me in. Um, I gave them all the advertising they need. I gave them all the information. I went in on the first week. 
nothing had been distributed. I went and knocked cell doors and spoke to people through the viewing hatch. And, you know, we spoke about Plato and Aristotle through the viewing hatch. Recruited 10 people for the next week. The next week I go in, nobody comes. It's because the officers didn't unlock them because they just didn't. <sighs> okay, week three, we, we go in. I go in an hour early. I, t I say to each of the officers, please, today unlock this man because he's coming to my class. So I'm already, I've perspired so much, so much sweat <laughs> before I even, hello, this is what philosophy means, introduction. Um, and that's very typical. Um, our prisons are really underfunded at the moment. They're not supposed to work. They're supposed to be inefficient. They're supposed to, people aren't supposed to have expectations. Things are supposed to drag. Things are supposed to be unreliable. That's I think part of, I think that's intentional. Uh, I know that sounds conspiratorial, but I, but I think it's part of a particular security style that people adopt when they don't have training money to, to run a proper regime. And also, you know, when I teach in schools or colleges, that building that I'm going into is built for education. And that whole management system is built for education in prison. It's built for punishment and it's built for security. And education is something of a, an aside or a fancy in that setting. So actually making it happen in prison requires so much blood, sweat and tears. I can do that because I'm paid and I can do that. I have the emotional capacity to do that for obvious reasons, given my background, but for many people, it's just too hard. So huh? when you're in the prison, you, you kind of in, you teach philosophy or you use philosophy as a, a tool for dialoguing? And that's one question that I have. <clears throat> And I also wonder whether you always work with a group of prisoners or if you sometimes work philosophically with one prisoner. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So um, I like, so I mean, I'm often in a room with maybe someone who has a reading age of eight and maybe someone who has a PhD. Uh, you know, because one of them has been in prison for 25 years and they've, they've got their head down and they've done some reading. <laughs> and one person, you know, was homeless yesterday and they got arrested and they've just had their first shower in three months and now they're in my classroom and they're like, what's going on? Um, so what I tend to do is I, I always start with a story, something very concrete, something that has an emotional connection. So, for example, Odysseus and the Sirens that I showed you in the slide. Or today I did the story of Caravaggio, Michelangelo Caravaggio, the painter, and his, um, his life story and how he once painted a uh, painting as a plea for clemency to try and get mercy from the Pope when he was wanted. It's a very, very philosophically rich dilemma. So we discussed the philosophy around that and with the sirens, it was freedom. And then once we've been discussing that for a bit and what freedom could mean, I we built up a nice dialogue and, and a curiosity. I bring in, okay, so uh, this is what uh, Isaiah Berlin said about freedom, positive and negative. Or here's what Seneca said, or here's what determinists would say. Or, you know, does that connect with what you think or do you think something different? So, so I teach the theories and ideas halfway through. I think so much education fails because we teach students answers to questions that they haven't asked us. <laughs> Whereas if you can generate a conversation, then people are asking questions and then they really want to hear these ideas. They really want to hear those answers. Um, which are the most uh, common philosophical themes or topics that your pupils gravitate to? I mean, people love the Stoics. Uh, it's not a surprise as to why it's a survival guide, basically. Um, I don't like Stoicism. <laughs> I agree with Sartre that Stoicism ensures that at the end of the day, the, the master is the master and the slave is the slave. I think I want a bit more 
crit something more critical in my philosophy of aestheticism. Um, but it has a lot of, it's very attractive and it's very humbling. You know, I do meet people who, you know, have picked up uh, Epictetus or Seneca and read it and lead these very disciplined lives and um, intense mental focus and in a place where it's easy to lose your mind, you know, and it, you know, although my sort of intellectual, I have intellectual problems with stoicism, I, I meet people who are sort of in that corner philosophically in prison and I, I find it very humbling, I have to say. Um, um, did you do this? Oh, I mean, you've been doing this for six years, right? Yes. Teaching in prisons with a lot of blood, sweat and tears, as you explained earlier. Uh, is it easier today to teach in prisons or like what has happened or changed in your practice? Um, I think it's it's capricious. So sometimes I have a I'm friends with the governor, for example. And they can just make things happen but then that governor will leave um we've had um 10 prison ministers in 11 years in the uk i mean our political turmoil is very well documented you know we we change prime ministers every six to eight minutes um but uh it's very unstable so one minute it can be smooth the next not but generally you know the effects of austerity and just cutting the budget, cutting the budget, cutting the budget, just, um, you know, I haven't seen tea bags in the staff room for years, you know, just things like that, just things that you go into work, there's tea bags so that you can make yourself a cup of tea at work, like that's, there's no money in the pot for that kind of stuff, it's, it's very, it's, it's, it feels quite serious, quite grim, you know, even for a prison. <laughs> So even though it's like, so even though it's like pushing a boulder up the mountain, what 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 keeps you going, even though it's so steep the hill? Um, I suppose love, maybe. Yeah. Um, I I just have some really fascinating conversations in there. Uh, it means a lot to me. You know, I with my background and everything you know I didn't do well at school I wasn't expected to do well at school and then I had a philosophy teacher who uh, when I was 17 sort of took a chance on me basically and saw that I was a pain and that I argued with everything he said and that you know I was arrogant and alienated and all the rest of it but he he could see that within all of that argumentative spirit was something philosophically valuable and actually being really alienated is kind of has advantages if you're a philosopher because it means you sort of see the world from the outside a lot of the time and that's one thing philosophers should do um and I, th I think you know if your life has been deeply touched by education and and deeply changed and affected uh and then to be an educator yourself it's it it's sort it's quite hard for as much as I complain to you about how hard it is to work in that world, it's quite hard for me to imagine not working in that world as well. You know, it's just, it's part of my amor fati, you know, it's part of my, I'm, this is me being the dog chasing the chariot. This is sort of my, <laughs> this is my purpose perhaps. Um, okay, so if we don't have any more questions or comments from the audience, I would like to say a big thank you to Andy West for taking your time to uh, um, speak to us about um, philosophy in prisons. Very interesting. And thank you all um, for your questions and your comments. And um, thanks to all of you who attended.